Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to this NRAS Live this evening. Um, tonight, I'm joined by a wonderful panel who are going to be talking about the new pregnancy guidelines uh, for inflammatory rheumatic disease that have been published this year by the BSR. And I'm going to just invite everybody to introduce themselves. Uh, we've got a lot to get through this evening, so we'll we'll get on with that now. So you're very welcome. Um, Ian, can I come to you first? You're first on my screen if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thanks very much. Yeah, my name's Ian Giles. I'm an academic rheumatologist from University College London, uh, and I uh, work in uh, carry out an obstetric rheumatology clinic twice a month and have a uh, research interest in this area. Thank you. Louise, can I come to you next? Louise. OK, I think Louise might be having a problem. Uh, let me come to Dr. Kate Duig. Hi, um, everyone. My name's Kate Duig. I'm an academic obstetrician from the University of Manchester. Thank you. And Kimmy. Hi, everybody. I'm Kimmy Heyrich. I'm an academic rheumatologist from Manchester, uh, and my research is understanding the uh, real world safety and effectiveness of biologics for rheumatoid arthritis. Thank you. Katie, can I come to you next? Hi, I'm Katie Pieris, um, and I'm a, a patient and NRAS volunteer. Thank you. Louise, can I come back to you? Can you hear me now? I'm joined by um, Ariba, my colleague tonight, who's um, doing you... behind the scenes. Um, now, oh, Louise, can you hear me? Ariba, I don't know if you can do anything to help. I can hear. Right, I'm going to hopefully hear leave you. that you. problem to my colleague to to sort out and um, perhaps we can kick off this evening with um, Ian, if I can come to you first to please tell us about the new guidelines and um, what they uh, what they say and what are the, the key differences? Because I know certainly things would have changed when from when I had my daughter in the early 80s. Um, uh, so I think we've got quite a lot of changes um, that have gone on recently, particularly with rela uh, re regard to the biologic drugs and whether these are safe to take during pregnancy. So over to you, Ian. Great, thanks. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening. I'm hoping my slides will appear on the screen or do I need to press something to make them appear larger? Uh, I am. Oh, uh, Ariba, would you be able to pop my slides front and centre or do I have to do something? There we go. Great. OK, I think it's hopefully going to appear to me in a moment. So uh, it's a pleasure to be presenting this evening on behalf of the British Society of Rheumatology Working Group, who formed to produce the guidelines that were published last year. Uh, I thought I would just mention on my next slide, if it will move forwards, a few disclosures which are listed on the slide there. And what I'm going to describe are the differences between this, the second edition and the first edition, talk a little bit about the process and then go through some of the main findings with a focus on biologic drugs, as that's what I was asked to do for this evening. So uh, the working group is shown listed on this slide. You can see the names of all of the different people and how they participated to the process. And the colour coding highlights the different specialities and backgrounds of the people involved. Yellow is for the rheumatologists of junior and senior uh, grading. Uh, green was for data analysts who helped with the data collection process because we were reviewing a large body of evidence. Uh, we had experts by experience, two members of the panel shown in light blue. The purple colour represents the obstetric and obstetric medicine input. 
Uh, and the red uh, shows that we had Ken Hodson, who's an obstetrician, but he's very special because he's the medical director of the UK Tetralogy Information Service. So that meant we had representation from their organisation on the panel from Ken. Uh, and Louise was part of the panel, a clinical nurse specialist. We had a pharmacist um, and a general practitioner. So representation from a wide variety of stakeholders, basically, and people who would use the documents. So the main differences between the first and the second edition are that previously they were sort of labelled parts one and two. Now they're two separate guidelines. And that's not just because there's a difference in the content, but there's a difference in the methodology that underlined how we produce the two guidelines that I'll mention in a moment. The number of drugs went up. Uh, the number of citations, although we were reviewing a shorter time period compared to before, we still screened a large number of articles and uh, reviewed evidence from a, a, almost as many articles as we did before. As I mentioned, we had input from the UK Tetralogy Information Service. We put some information in request to pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and our number of recommendations more than doubled around medication usage in pregnancy. And in contrast to the first edition where we didn't give any consideration uh, in relation to disease management or disease activity, we tried to include that in this edition. So the main questions that we were asking in relation to each drug are listed on this slide. Basically, should the drug be stopped preconception? Is it compatible with pregnancy? And we would comment on different trimesters of exposure where possible. Is it compatible with breastfeeding? And we also reviewed the evidence regarding paternal exposure. So this diagram uh, shows the process of selection. And on the left-hand side, uh, it shows the number of articles that were reviewed for the immunomodulatory guideline. And those, this is the sort of the guideline that reviews the bread and butter drugs that rheumatologists use to control disease activity and includes biologic drugs, which will be talked a little bit more about later on in this, present, in this uh, webinar. Uh, and this is where we went back to basics and we searched for all original evidence barring case reports. We put a setting at uh, a certain size of uh, cohort studies, but basically reviewed all of the evidence from there upwards, which is where you can see there were around 20,000 articles that we reviewed. For the other guideline, which reviews medicines that are used to manage comorbidities, so this is high blood pressure, um, chronic pain medications that, that are basically antidepressants, uh, blood thinning therapies. We took a different approach because there are a great many consensus documents written by organisations uh, that have already done evidence reviews extensively on this topic. We rather than go back and to re reinvent the wheel and repeat what they had done, we decided to set our filters and just select those high level documents and or systematic reviews to form the basis of our evidence and recommendations, which is why there's a much smaller number of articles that you can see formed the guideline, uh, informed the guideline around the comorbidity medications. So what were the key differences? Well, for the comorbidity guideline, this is focusing on painkillers for acute pain, chronic pain, high blood pressure, anticoagulation and they're listed in this slide here. And I'm gonna try and put this on the big screen for myself because I'm struggling to see what's on it. Uh, and some of the key differences are that we, a previous recommendation to use tramadol uh, in the first trimester, we changed a yes to a no. For the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are regular painkillers used to manage acute pain in inflammatory rheumatic diseases, uh, we put a recommendation to stop by week 30, although there is a, we do say irregular use before that in pregnancy, and there are various reasons why that's the case. And for colchicine and dapsone, these were drugs that although they're old drugs, well established in practice, uh, they were new to the guideline. We hadn't included them previously, and the evidence for them was very supportive. Ah, okay, so then I'll move on to my next slide. Uh, and we covered other drugs as well, uh, which have just jumped away from me. So let's see if I can go back to that one. 
which it's not doesn't want to go. Basically, uh, the many of the recommendations were similar to the ones that we've made before, um, with some slight changes around re allowance of use in special circumstances for blood thinning therapies, warfarin, uh, and uh, non and the ACE inhibitors, which are used to manage hypertension in patients often with multi system disease. For the immunomodulatory guideline. Uh, we put in some general recommendations. We talked how preconception counselling is important and should be done by people who have a specialism in this area. Uh, avoid pregnancy incompatible drugs. Explain the risks and benefits of medication and their, how they can control disease activity and how poorly controlled disease activity is not good for pregnancy. We recommended switching drugs that are contraindicated uh, and when no pregnancy compatible drugs are suitable, control of severe life threatening maternal disease should take priority over concerns for potential uh, fetal outcomes. The box that are highlighted in red are the ones that are relevant to the biologic drugs and we basically said that all biologic drugs may be continued throughout pregnancy if required to control active disease. We made a comment around immunization schedules and we talk about using the minimum effective dose and there's a comment around male usage as well and for the purposes of time I'm just going to skip on to the next slide which is very sluggish. Uh, and we made recommendations on the standard drugs, capped a dose on the hydroxychloroquine, shortened the interval at which you can stop methotrexate pre-pregnancy. And then made comments around the biologic drugs, which are all summarized in this slide. And hopefully you can see the red boxes. Uh, it's jumping around. And basically what we said was that all of the TNF inhibitors uh, are compatible with throughout pregnancy and breastfeeding without any really concerns to stop them. Uh, and the non-TNF inhibitors, where there's a much lower level of evidence, uh, they can certainly be used in the early stages of pregnancy with consideration to use them if they're required to control severe maternal disease. And I'll come back to that in statement in a moment. For the TNF inhibitors themselves, the full list of recommendations is listed on this slide here. And basically, we said slightly different things for slightly different drugs based upon the evidence that shows how well they cross from the mother to the baby and how long they exist in the fetal circulation at birth based upon that degree of transfer. And so although we say that certain drugs might be stopped at certain times in pregnancy, that's only so that the baby could then be drug free uh, after birth and could receive a normal vaccination schedule. Because there is concern that some live vaccines could potentially lead to complications in infants who've been exposed to biologic drugs in the later stages of pregnancy. For the non the other broadly speaking you can divide biologic drugs into tnf inhibitors and non-tnf inhibitors for the non-tnf inhibitors uh we made recommendations basically based upon the fact that there is much lower level of evidence uh, and said that if the drug is required to control severe maternal disease then it could be continued throughout pregnancy but live vaccines should be avoided uh, and broadly speaking, that was a similar recommendation that we made for all of the non-TNF inhibitors with a slight difference, uh, uh, basically the same for all of them. So hopefully that's a brief summary of the two new expanded pregnancy guidelines uh, and uh, a plea that if you want to read the full evidence review underlying the recommendations, then look beyond the uh, executive summary and read the full length guideline. Uh, and uh, also uh, can understand how they highlight the importance of suppression of maternal disease and supports the use of biologic drugs throughout pregnancy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. Gosh, that was a, a mammoth amount of work um, that you've, uh, you and the, the guideline group have obviously worked through. How long did it take you? 
so for the for the second iteration it was we were slightly delayed by covid as you can imagine because we started just before it was around about two years which was pretty quick compared to the first iteration right okay thank you um i'm sure we'll come to questions um after we've had everybody speak um so i'd like to come next to um dr kate duig and professor kimmy Heyrich. Um, from Manchester who are going to tell us more about a very exciting trial that's coming up called the MAMA trial. Um, and uh, I'm just going to hand straight over to you guys. I believe you're going to do a double act here. Um, hopefully we won't have any more gremlins. Um, apologies for some of the, the problems we've had with, with slides and so on. Um, so over to you guys. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, yeah, we'd love to talk to you today about the, the MAMA trial. Um, my name's Kate. I'm the lead obstetrician for the study, um, and Kimmy is the, the lead rheumatologist for this, um, this trial, which will be starting to open to recruitment towards the end of next year. Um, this trial is specifically looking at the use of monoclonal antibody medications, so biologic medications, in women with inflammatory arthritis in pregnancy. Um, and when we talk about inflammatory arthritis, I'm going to be referring to um, rheumatoid, but also psoriatic arthritis, ax axial spondyloarthritis, and juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, as all of these conditions do affect women of reproductive age. Up to about 25% of women will, will be on a biologic agent. Um, and biologics have really revolutionized rheumatology care. There's often much better disease control um, than historically they used to be, and more women are considering a, a pregnancy. But what we do know is that poor control of arthritis is associated with worse pregnancy outcomes. So if you have arthritis that's uncontrolled in pregnancy, you're more likely to have a baby that's born early or a baby that's born small or have other pregnancy complications. Um, I think Professor Giles has obviously summarised a lot of the evidence, but just really wanted to reiterate that biologics are not thought to cause any um, congenital harm to babies. Um, and really the concern about use of biologics is related to how they might affect the immune system of babies after, born, after, after birth. Um, so women are often, often come along to our obstetric clinics on a variety of treatments. Um, and the problem that we face is that if we stop medication, um, that may lead to a flare of their um, arthritis disease. Um, and this often ends up with us using uh, medication like steroids um, or anti-inflammatory medications, um, which are also associated with complications of pregnancy. So for example, steroid exposure in pregnancy is related to um, higher risk of developing gestational diabetes, which often can impact a pregnancy quite significantly. Um, when we were planning this study, we did a national survey, um, and there's, there's real differences in care um, across the UK and across different specialties. So um, our national survey said that only 8% of rheumatologists um, routinely continue biologics, except um, sertilizumab or Simsia, um, which people have more confidence in prescribing throughout pregnancy. Um, and this is despite pretty good safety data, um, and doctors are particularly guarded about prescribing newer generation drugs. Um, but if you look to other specialties, for example, our gastroenterology colleagues um, in women with inflammatory bowel, bowel disease seem to be much more liberal in how they prescribe these medications in pregnancy. Um, I just wanted to include some quotes really for the women who helped us to design um, the trial, which I'm going to do throughout my slides, but really highlighting the difficulty that some women face when making decisions about their care. Um, talking about how rheumatoid arthritis is like walking a tightrope and it taking a long time for them to find a combination of medication that works and being very fearful about coming off that, how they would manage flares during pregnancy um, and how they might respond when they go back onto their treatment after their babies are born, but also this guilt um, and, and feeling like, are they putting their own health before their babies? So very, very real and difficult um, decisions. Um, so um, we designed the MAMA trial with our, um, our patient advisors um, and the aim of the trial is to answer the question as to whether does continuing biologics throughout a pregnancy, so not stopping 
towards the end of pregnancy, does that result in lower arthritis disease activity um, compared to the women who stop before the third trimester, so don't take their biologic for the last three months of pregnancy? Um, and Kimmy's going to come on to talk to you about how we're going to measure arthritis disease activity. But we also want to know the impact on the pregnancy and the baby, the infant, including infections and immunity, um, and child development and cost um, and health quality related um, quality of life um, outcomes. We're going to be recruiting 328 women with inflammatory arthritis from across the country. Um, they'll come into the study at less than 28 weeks of pregnancy, and if they're happy to consent, um, they'll be randomly allocated either to stop their biologic before 28 weeks or continue throughout pregnancy. And this will be taking this will be um, going on, as I say, throughout um, the big obstetric units in the UK and in a network of rheumatology centres. Um, I think. As Professor Giles mentioned, counselling is really key and having good preconception counselling is really, really important. Um, this was a, a quote that I just wanted to share with one of our ladies who said that she didn't understand the risks of stopping, the risks of steroids, and which in her case, unfortunately, um, led to some, bit, some severe mental health complications in her pregnancy um, and how difficult it was for her to breastfeed her baby um, due to her joint disease. Um, so really important questions we're trying to answer. I'm going to hand over to Kimmy now. So one of the challenges we had when we were designing this clinical trial is we were going to include multiple different types of arthritis that present in different ways, but we needed a common measure. And we spent a lot of time discussing this with our colleagues and particularly with our patients. And we decided that our primary outcome measure would be based on something called the RAPID-3 which may not be one of the common outcome measures people listening um, are used to, more like the DAS-28 or the HACC, um, but actually this incorporates a lot of those uh, elements such as function, pain, and their health. So on the next slide, Kate. Some of these questions might seem very familiar to you, but these are questions that you might recognize from the hack score that we often use in rheumatology that also color covers other um, features such as sleeping and mental health, which was really important to our patient advisors. On the next slide. And it also will capture uh, elements of the disease activities such as pain uh, and then very common global impact of the arthritis scale. Uh, the good thing about this outcome measure is it's been validated against the more common outcome measures that we use across all of these conditions. So we knew that we had a consistent measure and it will pick up changes that are due to being pregnant. And it will also pick up changes that are due to the disease activity being too high during pregnancy. And the score should allow us to discriminate between those. Next slide. We had a lot of discussion with our patient advisors about when and how often we should uh, measure these given how we busy uh, having a newborn baby can be. And it was agreed that we would capture these frequently during the pregnancy, monthly, and then postpartum at three, six, and 12 months. And then also we're very interested in flares and flares don't happen regularly on a monthly basis. So there's going to be capacity to capture flares or any reports of disease activity throughout the pregnancy. Next slide. And these are just some comments that we had when we were discussing the rapid three that it's a very simple and easy scale to report. It's probably very familiar in its elements um, and Patients felt very happy to do this, particularly when they have a lot of anxiety during the state uh, of their pregnancy. And it also reflected very well with the things that they experienced during flares, such as dressing themselves and then later on uh, putting baby grows on their babies or changing nappies. And they were keen that we captured the smaller flares uh, and therefore the facility to report these will be incorporated. Next slide. So we're currently in the process of developing the way that we're going to capture these. And for the majority of women in the trial, this will be through an app that can be either uh, completed on a mobile phone, so you can have it when you're out and about, uh, or a tablet 
tablet or their computer. Uh, we needed something that was going to be easy to use, but we also recognize that it's important that not everyone who will be experiencing pregnancy and biologic may have access to these. And therefore, we're working on multiple different ways, uh, including telephone consultations and even postal questionnaires to make sure that we don't exclude anybody from the trial. We'll also be working uh, with some language interpreters and we're going to have advisors across a number of ethnicities that will work with us to make sure that this is appropriate for everybody. Next slide. So uh, Kate already mentioned that we'll be capturing some other outcomes during and after the pregnancy. So we're very interested in the uh, outcome of the pregnancy, such as whether there was prematurity and other common measures. Uh, we're interested with biologics, uh, always in infections, and in particularly where these drugs can increase the risk of infections in women during pregnancy. Uh, we'll be following the babies and the children. Uh, Kate, Kate's already mentioned the fact that we'll be measuring immune responses. So we don't have a major concern about the routine childhood vaccines that all children uh, receive, but there are. Uh, it's always important that we do study these in a controlled manner. Uh, and we'll be making sure that for those uh, parents that need particularly the live tuberculosis vaccine, uh, that this may be a group that unfortunately cannot take part because uh, Professor Giles has already clearly outlined that there are some concerns there. Um, and we're also going to be uh, working with the neonatologists for that aspect, but also experts in child development, um, because the uh, patients that we worked with in designing the trial were very uh, interested what the impact of having rheumatoid arthritis during a pregnancy could have on their own children's development. So I hope this will be very reassuring data. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, I think I've already mentioned this, there'll be a sub-study, uh, which will be an additional level of consent, uh, where we will take blood tests from the baby to study their immune systems as well. And last slides back to you, Kate. Um, yeah, thank you, Kimmy. So we just wanted to, to say we, we would love your support, really. Um, and, and thank you to UNRAS for giving us this forum to discuss this um, this trial. Uh, we'd love to hear from, um, from women and parents um, who have inflammatory arthritis, who have experience of pregnancy. That may be women who um, are planning a pregnancy have had a pregnancy or a pregnancy loss or, or who have completed their families, um, women of reproductive age in whom these, these questions are important. Um, we're looking for um, people to join our research advisory group. Um, you don't need any experience at all. Um, and the time commitment can be simply um, small amounts of your time, for example, testing an app right through to if you want to join our um, our trial advisory group and, and, and join our meetings. Um, all of your time is compensated and out-of-pocket expenses are also paid. So um, if anyone is interested, um, please contact me um, on my email address, um, which you can see at the bottom of the advert there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, really interesting um, to see that. And uh, Katie, <laughs> it looks like you're... Um you're perfect for, for what they're looking for. But anyway, uh, let me come to you next and uh, let's hear from, from the patient. Um, I know you've got a, a lovely young son um, and I, I know because you've been a volunteer with us for a number of years now, um, you know, we've, we've kind of been been alongside you as you've gone through the process yes. of getting <laughs> pregnant. So tell us a bit about your experiences. No, thank you. And I think it's brilliant all the sort of work that's um, going on in this area at the moment. So um, I guess kind of my story, I was diagnosed at um, 28. So in kind of prime position to potentially be, be kind of fertile and ready to start a family. Um, I wasn't um, kind of in that, that place um, in my life at that point. So I kind of started on um, all the kind of medications that at, at that point you had to kind of come off if you wanted to start a family. And I think one of the key things I did was when I was diagnosed, I kind of had that sort of open discussion with my um, rheumatologist about the potential plans. So um, I'd just moved in with my now husband at the time. Um, so I kind of kept that kind of dialogue 
um, open with my rheumatologist. So it was about sort of two, three years um, into my diagnosis. And I was quite happily sort of feeling quite well controlled on um, some of the, the sort of DMODs that many people that will be watching will be taking. And at that point in time, um, you had to come off or I was advised whether it was the actual sort of, um, you know, main advice at the time. Um, I was advised I'd need to come off methotrexate for about sort of six months prior to attempting to conceive. Um, so I went down the process of starting um, biologics. I was quite lucky um, that I got accepted to, to start um, a biologic at that point. But that biologic, you also had to come off if you wanted to conceive. So that was kind of a, a buffer by my rheumatology team to kind of get me through um, the sort of six months of, of being uh, needing to stop methotrexate. Um, and unfortunately, we had a few complications of um, trying to conceive. So that sort of whole process took a lot longer than we'd um, actually imagined it would. So I was really in a fortunate position because, um, as um, you've mentioned, I was doing a bit of volunteering for NRAS at the time. And it was actually when the previous um, new guidelines had come out in 2016. And I was really fortunate to then go and present those guidelines to um, my rheumatology team so that I could go because I was pretty much on no medication, which was absolutely horrendous because everything was sort of flaring again. I was feeling really unwell. Um, so the last thing, you know, you want to do is try to make a baby when everything is, is kind of hurting. Um, so thank, really, really thankfully, we were about to go into the sort of process of um, going down the route of IVF. Um, and luckily, the month I started on a new biologic was the month I conceived and the month we got the call that we've been accepted. I'm going, I'm going to start crying again. <laughs> Try not to, but it's so, <laughs> it's such a, an emotional kind of thing, starting a family. So I hope I can kind of bring the perspective of actually the new guidelines, what they will actually mean to future parents. And I'm going, we'll probably come on to it, but we, um, NRAS have a um, digital support group for um, sort of parents or people that um, are looking to become parents. And some of the stories on there of people that conceived um, babies earlier than me, and sort of they weren't allowed access to any medication. They, they, they had to sort of go through all this without any anything at all. You know, I feel really, really lucky that throughout pregnancy, I was able to be on a biologic up to about the third trimester. Um, and you never know, you, some people say sort of pregnancy means that many of your symptoms go away. Um, so I was really lucky that actually through pregnancy, I had a really, it was like the best my rheumatoid arthritis had, had been, and it was absolutely lovely. Um, but then you hear the stories of people having um, real problems once they've given birth. Um, so you hear lots of people might have kind of major, major flares at that point. I was very, very lucky again um, that it didn't sort of happen. It just happened very, very um, gradually. So um, when my son was about nine months old, so I think this is the thing as well, it's kind of managing when you might sort of flare up and how you kind of manage that when you've, you've had a baby. But based on the sort of things that are happening now, if you can continue the majority of medications through that process, then I think it makes those outcomes kind of, kind of uh, you know, for the, the mum at home mentally, it really, really helps if you kind of feel that you're going to have that sort of medical support to kind of keep you well, because it's a little bit like the um, plane crash scenario, always put your own oxygen mask on first. So the, the mum, um, the parent needs to be well in order to sort of sufficiently sort of um, look after their child. I've gone completely off um, my bullet points that I've written down. Um, but, you know, I think it's really, really positive to see these changes. And I think I would have loved to have been able to 
be presented with all this information when I was in in the position sort of 10, 10 um, years ago and I was sort of looking to go you know start this this journey and it it's um just brilliant to see that these things um are kind of forever changing and that there are um I think the the trial that's going on is fantastic to see as well um and I think one of the other things I struggled with so I wanted to breastfeed and my plan that I'd sort of put in place a plan with my rheumatology team that I would only breastfeed for six months so that I could go back onto the biologic that I'd been on previously. But it, it, you don't, you, it, you can't plan that. My son wouldn't take a bottle and the stress of trying to get my son to take a bottle so that I could go and back, back on medication, it was absolutely horrific. I wouldn't wish that sort of stress on anybody. I know breastfeeding to begin with was absolutely awful, trying to, trying to breastfeed, when you're having kind of wrist flares um things like that but then when it's all going well and it's all working then the stress of being asked by a rheumatology team to to stop breastfeeding and to bottle feed so that you can go back onto your medication it just wasn't practical so i was off a lot of my medication for from sort of that third trimester and then i kept going kind of booking sort of in for um uh, injections and things to sort of try and manage my flares because as your baby gets heavier trying to manage those flares is also a really really horrible horrible time um so it, I actually started reading myself and doing a bit of research and I went back to my rheumatologist and said look I've read this medication um you can breastfeed with please will you prescribe it for me because I can't be doing this any longer I was planning to go back to work sort of when my son was about 12 months um so the thought of being in agony trying to do feeds trying to do everything else that you need to do and go to work would have been absolutely sort of catastrophic but I know that there'll be many patients out there that you know don't have access to some of that information which is why this is fantastic to make sure that everybody's empowered and can have those conversations but it's also knowing that rheumatology teams are up to date and aren't scared about prescribing some of these medications because I think that can sometimes be from my experience I think that was a little bit of a barrier that obviously when there's you know babies involved people are a little bit scared of anything um, but it's just making sure everybody's completely up to speed with what you know the patient is allowed um, you know, and and that all the guidelines are in place, which is brilliant to see. I think that's everything from me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Went, went off on one there a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's. Uh, I think it's really important to get that personal lived experience of these things. Um, I remember when um, when I was pregnant, I'd, I'd only recently before I got pregnant being diagnosed and I also struggled to get pregnant in fact I was told yeah. I would never get pregnant um, and um, in fact I, I honestly don't remember um, being cancelled about methotrexate or anything at the time I suppose I must have been but it's a long time ago yeah. um, but uh, I was fine when I was when I was pregnant but when I um, after I'd given birth about six weeks afterwards, having just been in one knee, it just went whoosh everywhere. And uh, I can remember um, really struggling trying to pick Anna up and change nappies and so on. It's just a nightmare. Yeah, and it's everything, yeah. little buttons or oh, little yeah. fiddly thing. I mean, the best thing I found was zip baby grows. They're a little yeah. bit more expensive, but absolutely brilliant. <laughs> you should get some NRAS ones. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea NRAS baby boys right um now I believe we have a problem a technical problem we do seem to have had the gremlins tonight um Louise uh has um dropped off uh and she's obviously having problems at her end I think must be her internet perhaps um and um I don't know uh Ariba whether she's likely to be back any second now 
Um, but uh, if not, I think what we'll do is go straight to um, some questions. And hopefully if, if Louise, if we manage to get Louise back, um, we can come to her presentation um, when she comes back. That was going to particularly be from the nurse specialist perspective and um, you know how uh, Im important it is to counsel patients well in advance and so on. So um, if she comes back, great. If not, uh, we will find a way to get her slides included with the, the final presentation. So some questions. Uh, well, we've had a couple of questions submitted um, prior to tonight, and we've also got some others that have come in in the meantime. Um, Ian, can I ask you, first of all, what is the selection criteria and process involved for someone who might be interested to become a member of the BSR guideline working group, obviously from a, a health professional? Uh, so the well, in fact, um, the the standard order in guidelines working group, as it used to be known, has now changed its name recently to the guideline steering group. Uh, and it does advertise for membership on a regular basis. That's to the, the group which sort of oversees the um, a production of all of the BSR guidelines that are produced. And there are, there are many in existence and many also in production at the moment, new ones and both updates of existing guidelines. The process for which people can apply to become members of uh, individual working groups uh, has also changed um, uh, through a plea from trainee committees, amongst others, to make the process more equitable and open to all. Uh, and I think there is an actual a current, there was a recent advert to uh, encourage trainee applications to a respiratory complications of rheumatic disease guideline that's in development and they're, they're forming the working group and there's a selection process of the applications that have come in and I think there might be a current live advert for another guideline I forget which one at the moment um, but so there's going to be a lot more opportunities through just keeping an eye on the BSR announcements and websites to be able to right. join not just the steering committee overall but individual working groups as well. OK, great. So I think the answer to that is keep your eye on the BSR website uh, and make sure that you're signed up to the BSR e-news. Um, so another question for you, Ian, while I'm with you, um, with so many drugs having come to market in recent years and we've got, you know, an interesting pipeline of, of drugs that will continue to come and there's so much research going on in this area. I imagine that these new guidelines are going to need fairly frequent review and adjustment. Um, so will your will your guideline group continue to just keep an eye on things and um, you know change things you know as things happen and as new drugs come to market and so on? <clears throat> so so there's a balance here because the, as you as you rightly say, there is a continuing expansion of new information uh, and there's lots of relevant articles. Even we closed our literature search in June 21 for the guidelines that were published last year. And already there's been sort of a few relevant articles published in relation to, to um, biologic exposure and infant immune response that I would have liked to have included, but we didn't. And in fact, other guidelines have been produced that have made slightly different recommendations around vaccine use. So yes, we certainly do need to keep a regular eye on things, but as you can appreciate, it's quite a an arduous process. But what will happen in the future is just like NICE is moving towards a living guideline process, so will the BSR. And I think that will then allow guidelines to sort of update components of it that are most in need of it. So for the prescribing in pregnancy guidelines, I would perhaps imagine that the biologic section is one that would be in most need of an update, not too far into the future, in contrast to the use of antihypertensives and antidepressants, which are used for chronic medic pain medications in pregnancy, for instance. Um, but I still uh, <laughs> need a bit of a rest before I think about doing it again, or hand it <laughs> on to someone. That I can I can understand. I was on the guideline group for the RA guidelines, so I I, I know the uh, the process. Um, 
So one thing that I noted from the guideline, um, and, and I'll ask this to uh, all of the professionals, um, obviously there are drugs that um, are not suitable for people to take whilst pregnant. And the guideline does talk about highly effective contraception. So what are you considering to be highly effective contraception? Is that something that, Kate, you want to take? Yeah, I would, I would. Yes, I can give you the rheumatologist perspective. It's very short. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Kate will give the much better answer. <laughs> Go on then, Ian. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So long acting reversible contraceptives. That's the rheumatologist's answer. Uh, but I'm sure Kate will have a there's a much better way of saying that. OK. Uh, Kate seems to be having um, a connection issue. Are you with us, Kate? Can you hear us? Um, sorry. Yes, I can. I can hear you now. Sorry. I've Know what happened there. Um, yeah, so we're talking about long acting methods of reversible contraception. So that would usually be things like um, a coil, um, a mar marina or a, or a copper coil, or um, an implant or the depot injection. So um, methods of contraception that are um, are reversible, obviously, because we're talking about using these in women of reproductive age who may want to make decisions about their families, um, but that, although not foolproof, are, are very reliable, much more so than, um, than things like the pill. Okay, thank you. I'm sure that will be of interest. Um, Katie, um, perhaps I can uh, come to you with a, a couple of questions. Um, you did tell us that you you had a lot of flares and so on was there anything in particular that you found um helped particularly in terms of managing those flares um particularly during your pregnancy and then after the birth so it was mainly sort of after the birth that i um had quite a few flares so i essentially um would go and see my rheumatologist for um, steroid injections to to sort of manage those flares, or or sort of using at home um, painkillers and um, ibuprofen and things like that, depending on the severity and how long they lasted. Right, um, and once baby was born and um you were on your own and so on what what how did you manage what what did you find um were the things that that kind of helped you stay vaguely in control if i can put it in that way <laughs> or not um, coffee um but i think it was sort of when buying i guess all the stuff the lots of stuff you end up buying pre-baby looking um for options that were kind of easy so easy to open prams um as light as possible kind of car seat um i found actually baby car the baby carrier was the easiest way just to go out although fastening at the back I, I regularly had to ask people in kind of shops or if i'd gone gone out and got the baby out um i'd be asking people to help kind of do it up at the back because my wrists kind of had problems um so i think it was always actually just not being afraid to um ask for help whether it's a stranger whether it's a family member or whether it's your neighbor or the sort of nct mums okay great um so can i just come back now to um maybe ian uh, one of the things that i i noted um from the um the guideline was the potential need for a national pregnancy registry uh, for patients with rheumatic disease. Um, I believe there is one that exists for epilepsy. Um, is this something that you think is a, is a realistic prospect? And we've got the perfect person also on the call in, in Kimmy, uh, who looks after the biologics register in RA. So is that is that something that you can see um, happening it sounds to me like it would be incredibly helpful and useful in terms of looking at um, data long term you're absolutely right it's 
it's something that's missing. It's a really important thing. Uh, it often comes up if you write any sort of pregnancy related article and think of future research agenda. It's something it's always sort of listed there. And in fact, I've had this conversation with Kimmy before uh, and um, and didn't and haven't basically managed to make it a reality. Uh, and there are various reasons why that's the case. Uh, so so I'm sort of trying to move forwards in other ways to gain a wealth of pregnancy information from different centres. But a so pregnancy registry, certainly not in my hands, is going to be a reality in the near future. There's definitely a movement across Europe now for more and more pregnancy registers. And ULAR, who's our European Rheumatology Association, um, that say sits above the the BSR has come up with guidelines on the types of data that should be consistently captured. And it might be that Ian and I need to chat again because not all women will enter the MAMA trial for so many reasons. And But it might be the time that we will be having a lot more contact. The challenge with all of these registers, and Ian will know this as well as me, is, is finances and funding them. Uh, they're incredibly expensive, they're incredibly labor intensive, and uh, it's sometimes very hard to find a funder to actually give you the money to do that, even though we here know how important that would be. Mm. Okay. Um, so just on that, uh, on the, the mama side of things, when is the trial due to start? Um, so it should be opening in the autumn of next year, um, which seems quite far away, but actually thinking about it, um, it's very likely that women that are coming to preconception counselling um, appointments presently are very likely to be um, at the right sort of time of their pregnancy to be included. So it's very relevant to anyone planning a pregnancy now. Um, just wanted to mention the other thing about um, whilst uh, it's not a pregnancy register, there is also an ongoing um, national cohort study looking at um, more novel biologic agents reported via UCOS, which is the UK Obstetric Surveillance System, which is a national um, system of collecting data about rare pregnancy complications. Um, so all... Um, all units in the UK report to that. So um, that should hopefully give more confidence about newer biologic um, agents that are coming onto the market. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully we're gathering evidence um, and in terms of the trial, we'll be inviting women um, autumn of next year to join. Okay, and presumably if anybody listening or who subsequently watches this back in the next uh, weeks, um, they get in touch with you direct on your email address, which I believe is in the chat, yeah? Yeah, lovely, thank you. Okay. Um, as a nurse, uh, I'm just thinking about maybe the nurses that might be watching tonight. Um, do you need to have completed any kind of competency framework in regard to counselling women about pregnancy or the guidelines or anything um, to, to work with this patient group or is that not the case? I don't know who wants to answer that as Louise isn't here. Um, well, I, I can speak. So I'm a rheumatologist at Manchester Royal Infirmary and like uh, Ian in London, we'll work with a group of specialist nurses that are often the first point of contact for this information. So when the new guidelines were published, it was really important that we sat down with them and made sure that we all understood what the guidelines said, what they meant and how they differed. Um, and in fact, our nurses have been really proactive and put a giant poster up in the waiting room for people to read even while uh, they're waiting, usually a long time because I run late often um, to see me. Uh, so I think sharing that information and I think the nurses um, are, are very well placed because they often have more time to discuss that. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Kate has just popped her a note into the chat to say, my nurse was never aware of the 2016 guidelines. How can patients help spread the word? I think NRAS is more present in rheumatology clinics over the last 10 years. And I think there is more, um, so the voice of NRAS I think is heard 
in rheumatology clinics. So I think we could use this organization to do it. I think rheumatologists have a responsibility as well uh, to make sure that all of us are practicing against uh, guidelines. It's hard. There are so many guidelines that come out, um, no. but you know they're there to make sure that we're delivering the best quality practice. Okay. And, to, and to make sure we're having equality of practice across the country. Sure. Well, we've got a, um, a September magazine. Our autumn magazine is out and um, there is uh, an article um, in there about the guidelines. And um, so I think one of the things that we could do is maybe turn that article into a, a downloadable PDF um, and um, send it out through our health e-news, health professional e-news. So there's definitely things that I'm sure we can do um, to raise awareness um, and just to keep it up there. And of course, it'll be on, on the website. Um, you mentioned um, quite a lot um, about um, checking for immunity once the baby is born um, and live vaccines and so on. And, and, and how it just from my own interest, how, how do you check um, a newborn baby's immune system for any defects? How do you do that? <laughs> I mean, obviously it'll, you can do a blood test, but what are you going to see in a blood test that will tell you that this baby's immune system is in some way um, malfunctioning or damaged or? Um, I fear that might slightly be out of my scope of practice, um, Elsa, but we're working with a team of um, paediatric vaccinologists from the University of Oxford. Um, one of the things that we're interested in is the diff that in an infant's immunity may actually change after it's born. So we may see certain changes in a baby's immunity at three months that might be different to five months and, um, and up to and after a year. Um, so actually, one of the important things is following up these babies, not just in the short term, but slightly longer term. And interestingly, from our um, patient representatives, we were we were somewhat anxious about is that a, is that a big ask for parents? Um, you know, I'd, feeling like how would I have felt if somebody wanted to take blood from from my baby? But actually, the feedback was pretty positive. Very many women said they wanted to be reassured actually that their baby's um, immune system was was working and that they felt that that was a really important um, question that needed to be answered. Um, so it is very acceptable um, to the women that we spoke to that we would follow their babies up. Um, so we're planning on um, taking blood tests at three time points after the baby's born. Right. Okay. Can I just add that I think I just wanted to add that I think we don't have concern that we're going to damage immune systems or impair them for life. And babies are incredibly resilient. And there's sure. there's evidence that women who've had rituximab during pregnancy, their baby's blood counts will look the same as the mum's, but the babies recover very well. Uh, right. So I think, you know, the data that we've seen is very, very reassuring. That's great to but know. And, needs to and be done. I'm sure you're going to get so much more information from your trial um, as, it, as it happens. So we'll, uh, we will be looking forward to reporting the results of that. Um, I can see that uh, we're coming up to the end of our hour. So um, I would like to, I've just got a few NRAS events to tell you all about, but I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you all very much indeed um, for spending time with us this evening for your valuable expertise. And um, I'm sure that um, it will be, um, this will be a resource that will be very well, very well used by people, um, both women looking to get pregnant and by health professionals. So thank you all. And I'm just sorry that um, Louise has obviously been blown away by the gale that is, uh, we've, we've had a few gales circulating around the UK this week, haven't we? So um, it's a pity that we haven't had, but we will put her slides up um, on our website and um, I'm sure she will be very sorry not to have been able to, to present in person. Um, so, as you know, our live NRAS live events run on the last Wednesday of every month, except December. And our October session is on October the 25th, hosted by our CEO, Claire, on the topic of our Stress Matters survey and findings. 
stress is such an important topic for people and many think that it was stress that triggered their RA. So I'm sure that will be an interesting evening. November is all about men's health in uh, and their RA health. Um, and that's going to be hosted by um, two of our staff, Tim and Stuart, um, and uh, will be the last of our NRS live events on November the 20th, 29th at 7. So do join us for that. Um, also relevant to tonight's live session is our upcoming Parenting with IA meeting. And um, I believe you've got the group. There you go. You've got the, the link for that. You'll find that on our website in our events section. And I hate to say the C word, but we only have 89 days to Christmas, folks. <laughs> so sorry to say that in September, we're not even in October yet, but we do have our Christmas shop up and live. And here's the link. If you just Google uh, NRAS Christmas Shop 2023, you will find it. Uh, and we've got lots of lovely things on there that you can order, including all our Christmas card selection. So please have a look at that. Um, and also just to flag that um, our complete membership package is only £25 a year, just over two, £2 a month. So amazing value. And for that, you get our newsroom magazines twice a year, spring and autumn. You get our monthly members e-news, our members online library access, biannual online meeting and a joining gift. So what's not to love? You could even give NRAS membership to somebody for a Christmas present. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up and say thank you all again. Good night. And we will see you on our next NRAS Live. Good night.